Now, I've been waiting for this moment for a long time uh, to meet with this special guest in person. She is a British Japanese artist who creates machine, robotic, music, and video, exploring issues surrounding technology and pop culture. Her film and installation works were presented in international museums, including MoMA in New York and Museum of Contemporary Art Tokyo. She is also the assistant professor at MIT Media Lab. Now, may I please invite Sponeko, our keynote speaker of today. Shake hand, please. Um, I'm a bit tall, so I'm, can I take my high heels off in the beginning? <laughs> to reach the mic, that's better. Okay. Hi. Um, so my name is Spatniko. That's not my real name, but that's my artist's name. <laughs> and um, basically, um, I'm an artist, but uh, I also direct a research group called Design Fiction Group at MIT Media Lab. And to tell you a little bit, about myself. I grew up in Japan, but my mother is British. So I studied uh, in London. I, I studied mathematics and computer science at Imperial College. And then I did a master's at Royal College of Art in uh, design interactions. And then I moved back to Tokyo. And then MIT Media Lab invited me to start a new group, uh, which is called Design Fiction in 2013. And now I'm sort of back and forth between MIT Tokyo, and also Hong Kong is my favorite city in Asia, so it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much, Mill6, for inviting me, and it's a pleasure to join you all today. I'm really looking forward to all the sessions. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my work, especially ones related to textiles. And uh, my interest I, is uh, mostly that I am interested in exploring emerging biotechnologies or digital technologies and thinking about possible impact they have on future uh, how we live or, and also fashion, textile, many, many things. So, can you see this? Is it? So this is a photograph, it's a little bit hard to see. This is from the exhibition uh, I just did at the Victor and Albert Museum this May. And this, is, this piece is called Transflora. And what you see there, can you see? Um, it's the silk that's used in this dress is a genetically engineered silk. So I collaborated with genetic engineers uh, in uh, Tsukuba working in um, this Institute of Agrobiological Sciences and they developed ways to add a DNA of jellyfish and coral to a silkworm so that the silkworm produced silk that glows red or green. And these are the, from uh, GFP and RFP. And if you see the video, this video, so can you see that? That's a, that's a silkworm with added DNA of uh, coral and jellyfish. And you can see that if you add the DNA, the silkworm's eyes glow red and green. And also the silk that they produce glow. And it's almost like a cyborg silkworm. And you think this is science fiction, but this is a real science that's happening. I actually filmed this using my iPhone, like, like that in the Institute. So working with the technology, I I also worked with uh, Hoso, which is a very um, traditional kimono-making family in Kyoto. And we try to use this genetically engineered silk to create a kimono fabric, because Nishijin, this kimono family, uh, they've been running for 13 generations. And always they worked with you know, new themes and new technology to develop this kimono culture. So they were really excited to work with this silk. And I'm going to show you. So that's the silkworm cocoon with the genetically engineered silk. 
So you could create these different colored uh, silkworm silk cocoons. So we try to combine this uh, biomaterial with this kimono fabric. And I'm going to, so this project was, this was exhibited in Victoria and Albert Museum, but it was actually initially sponsored by Gucci, the fashion brand. So I'm going to show you the video of my show I did at the Gucci Gallery in uh, Tokyo. They're actually silkworm cocoons. So we use 3,000 silkworm cocoons, genetically engineered silkworm cocoons. red filter, uh, orange filter, you can see the real color. And that's how it looks under a natural light. It's completely beige. So only when you um, shine it with a blue LED light and uh, see it through this uh, orange filter. So this is, so this work, I think some of you have seen the V&A show here, like I think I recognize some faces. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. So yeah, so it was, um, so it, at the V&A we showed this in this uh, tapestry, um, in the medieval tapestry room. Uh, which was really an exciting experience. And also V&A decided to take this as a permanent collection. But we have more, so I would love to show this in Hong Kong. If you're interested, please let me know. So, <laughs> yeah, I would love to show this. Oh, so one's going to be in London, but we're making more in Japan. So, so um, the next project is also um, using, uh, we also collaborated with the sci same scientists. So this project is called the Red Silker Fate Tamaki's Crush. And uh, in this project, I was exploring um, this East Asian mythology of the Red String of Fate. So this is a really famous mythology in Japan. And I heard it, it's also known in China. Like, do, do you guys? Yeah, you know about the Restoring of Fate. So it's an East Asian mythology that says that two people destined to meet each other romantically are uh, connected with this invisible red string of fate. So this is something that we think it's in the, you know, mythical, it doesn't happen in the real world. But in this project, I wanted to explore, okay, this mythology, can we actually try to recreate it through science. So can we genetically engineer this red string of fate? So I showed how you could add the DNA of a red coral to make a silk glow red, right? Well, there's, I also started thinking about adding a DNA that produces oxytocin. So how many of you have heard of oxytocin here? OK, so oxytocin is called a romantic hormone, a love hormone, a social bonding hormone. And it's a hormone that's, uh, it, that's released in your brain when you fall in love with someone, when you're hugging someone, or when you're in this trusting relationship. So I had this idea of adding genes that could produce oxytocin and also produce this red glowing protein. And uh, I went to the scientists and I said, can we actually try to genetically engineer silkworm that can produce this red glowing silk containing this 
oxytocin, love hormone? And the answer was, okay, that's, that's actually a really crazy idea, but it's actually possible. And we're going to try to see whether uh, we could genetically engineer this thing. So when we started talking about this idea, it was actually April 2015. And uh, after um, a lot of discussion in June, uh, they started trying to inject uh, the genes into the silkworm. And in December, that's eight months after we started the discussion, they managed to produce the first silkworm that produced this red glowing silk containing oxytocin. So that's a photograph that they sent me. It's the first photograph that I got uh, as an attachment on Gmail. It's like, look, we managed to make this silk and we, we saw oxytocin in there. And just because there's oxytocin in the silk, it doesn't mean that you know, you automatically fall in love. Love is more complex than that. So it's a very, it's a very symbolic thing, but still it's really interesting how something that's almost like in a mythology or something that we think would never happen in real life could actually come out from an artist's imagination like that and in just eight months. And also science has long challenged and demystified the world of mythology from the times of Galileo Galilei uh, going in the trial with the church when he proposed that the earth rotates around the sun or Darwin's theory of evolution. But looking at the recent uh, progress of biotechnology and genetic engineering, it, it almost looks like science is kind of recreating a new future that's almost like mythology, a new mythical future reality. So I, in this project, I wanted to really look at this strange world that we're starting to live in. Oops. And uh, I also, I am a musician and also a filmmaker. So I directed a film, a music film, which is basically this modern day bio mythology. So the character here, the main character, she's called Tamaki, and she is an aspiring genetic engineer. And she falls in love with Sachihiko, uh, which is this uh, guy, which I'm playing actually right there. And she falls in love with Sachihiko, and she really, really wants this love to work. But Sachihiko doesn't notice that this um, affection she has. So one day she decides, okay, maybe there's no red string of fate between me and Sachiko, but I am gonna genetically engineer my own red string of fate to get the heart of my crush. So she goes back to her house and starts DIY bioengineering to make her own red string of fate. But as she does this, this strange, mythical power start to inhabit her and her own creation. So strange things start to happen to this red string of fate that she creates. So I'll show you the video. Um, and could you turn the volume a little bit up when I show the video? Okay. Oh. <laughs>
ホルモンオキシトシンを作る遺伝子をこの卵に注射すれば恋に落ちる運命の赤い糸生み出せるはず蚕の目が光れば成功のサインなんだけど折れちゃったんだいに So this is the real uh, genetically engineered red sulcrophate, and as you can see, it doesn't work that well as in the film. You know, your eyes are not glowing. You're not, you're not running after me. <laughs> so oxytocin, yet yeah, not yet. So oxytocin doesn't work that well, like、uh, Tamaki said. But who knows? Someday, maybe something like that could be coming out from science. You just never know. And You, I think you saw that there were a lot of references to the shrine Shinto, and it's because I grew up in Japan and I'm really familiar with the Shinto religion. But I studied in London, Imperial College, and、uh, now I'm at MIT. And I'm also aware of the many taboos or ethical boundaries that some of these bioengineering sci sci sciences are crossing, especially. Religion,、uh, in terms of religion, and、uh, Time had this very、uh, symbolic cover, I think in 2006, saying God versus science with this、uh, DNA strand. But it's interesting. To, I thought it would be interesting to view science from many cultural perspectives, especially in terms of religion, because Shinto religion, which I'm familiar with. Uh, they tend to see that there's a spirit or God residing in ocean, in rocks, in trees, in an, a fly, in a little bacteria, anything, anything around you, there's a Shinto spirit. So I was thinking, 
okay, if I genetically engineer this silkworm that produces the red silk of fate, wouldn't there be a new Shinto spirit in there as well, in terms of the Shinto thinking? So I actually visited a Shinto priest uh, in a Kanda Myojin Shrine, which is a 1300 years old shrine. And I started to ask questions like, so I'm working with scientists to make this new living thing. How is this viewed from the Shinto perspective? Is this a big no-no or is this something that's acceptable? And the reason why also I went to see uh, Kanda Myojin Shrine is they're known for making these little protecting amulets to protect you from computer crashes or computer viruses. <laughs> so I thought maybe, you know, this 1300 years old shrine making these computer crash protecting amulets, maybe they have an understanding for genetic engineering. And the answer I got was really interesting. So they were like, they, they saw my work and re the silk and they were like, hmm, that's interesting. But we think that you know, we, there's still this new Shinto spirit in this red silkworm that produces a red silk of fate. And actually, this silk is really interesting. Can we make an uh, amulet together? Together in the shrine. So they were like, let's work together to make a new thing. So, so that really surprised me. But that really also excited me. It's, I wanted to create a new artwork that showed this alternative view of looking at science from another uh, religion. So after that, um, we started building the, the world's first Shinto shrine that worships this silkworm that produces the red silk of fate. Mm -hmm. So a Shinto shrine that worships a genetically engineered animal. <laughs> so, we opened this uh, shrine and an art pavilion last, uh, no, this year, sorry, my memory, <laughs> this March in uh, Teshima, which is an island uh, next to Naoshima. So this is part of the Setoichi Art Triennale. So you could, you could visit there. Uh, it's, it's a permanent pavilion. You could go there and see the shrine anytime. And we worked with a local priest to open this shrine. And I'll show you photographs. So we renovated an old, old Japanese house into, so we have these shrines, the Tori gate. But then inside the shrine, it's a bio, biology lab. So this is where the Tamaki, the main character of the film, worked and created her own new mythology. So it looks like that. Like that from another view. And we also created a space where people can make wishes about their new, like romance, love, and put it, it's like, like a wishing board space. And that's from the opening of the pavilion. So that's, um, that's, that was a really interesting experience working with scientists and Shinto priests and uh, looking at this uh, new science from completely different uh, religious perspective. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the new project I started working on. Uh, so this is a research from Riken Center for Developmental Biology and what they did they managed to uh, use iPS stem cell technology to create skin that can grow hair. And uh, so this is a photograph of that skin that's growing hair. And the implication of this is that uh, you could grow fur without, uh, you know, you, you could grow fur in the lab. You don't have to take fur from a living animal, and which has massive implications for fashion because there's a lot of controversy about using fur in fashion. But then another implication I'm interested in is that 
what if I can create a garment that's not just, you know, fur, as in like rabbit, rabbit fur or other fur, but what if you could grow garment that's uh, hair from myself, or if I have a long distance husband living far away, what if I grow his hair onto the skin I have in my living room? I started exploring these possible scenario f using this technology. So this is still work in progress, but hopefully uh, next year, summer or fall, I can show you something that's uh, very, a uh, little bit hairy and a little bit messy. <laughs> and uh, so I actually completely miscalculated my time and I have like 15 more minutes uh, left and that's actually my last slide. And uh, can I show you, because I completely miscalculated my time, is it possible to show <laughs> my moonwalk machine video? Is it not possible? Because that's a lot to do with women, technology, and uh, girl power. <laughs> Which, <laughs> sorry, like I completely misjudged the time. If not, I can go into Q and A and talk about these projects here. Let me. Know. While we wait, we could we could do like a mini Q and A session. Yeah, can I, could you? So, did people hear that question? So, the question was, am I doing this project for art, design, or science? And the answer to that is, um, I don't really, uh, I'm not, so bothered about genres or boundaries so much. I'm just working because I'm curious about how the world changes or how our view changes. And recent bioengineering, and not just bioengineering, like artificial intelligence or blockchain, these things are really changing the way we run our lives or the way we communicate or the way we think about civilization. So that that's really interesting to me. So through my artwork, I'm kind of proposing these alternative futures. And by seeing this work, you kind of look back. Oh, great. I is this part of the slide? OK, can, you <laughs> can I talk about this video before you stop playing? OK, great. Thank you. Yay. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this work. <laughs> okay. So uh, after I answer this question. So, yeah, through my work, I like to um, ask questions about these alternative futures. But then by looking at these futures, you could understand better about our own values now, like how we viewed science as something that's, you know, anti-religion or anti-ethics. But then maybe some religions could view the science as something hybrid together. And I'm very curious to know how it's viewed in from Chinese religion or philosophy, this kind of new science. So I'm happy to discuss about that. So, so I'm going to, is, is it OK if I go into this uh, project, Moonwalk Regime, because I have a bit more time. I'm going to talk about this. Uh, this is another uh, work that I did. And this is a work that I showed 2013. And at, at the time, I was really frustrated how in 1969, when Neil Armstrong made his first gigantic leap for humankind on the surface of the moon, it's been almost 50 years, and there's only been 12 white, macho American guys walking on the surface of the moon. And there's no women, <laughs> and there's no other, uh, you know, other other race, other countries. I thought, you know, the moon is something so open. You could see it anywhere in the world. And you think it's so accessible, but actually, because of the, you know, the situation with the political space race and all that, only selected people have actually been to the moon and walked on the surface of the moon. So I was really annoyed with that. And I really wanted to make work that really 
showed how girls want to go to the space and go walk on the moon. And uh, this is, um, I, one day, so I, was, I had this idea, and one day I got this email in my Gmail inbox, and this email was actually from, it said, from NASA. So <laughs> I was like, okay, is this like a new spam phishing email? Like, is this someone trying to fool me? So I opened this email, and it said, hi, I, I'm Jancy, I work with NASA. And Sputnik Go, we saw your work on YouTube, and your videos, your music, and we saw that you work with technology, and you also like to work with, uh, you know, girl power, gender, feminism. And at NASA, we really want more female students to be interested in space, and we want more women involved in uh, thinking about space. And would you like to work with us to make uh, you know, a video together, a project together. And I was like, uh, yeah, 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 of course. And, and I emailed De straight away and said, okay, let's set up a Skype call. And we did a Skype. And I actually uh, saw that Jancy was a real person and she was calling from Texas, Houston. And we started talking. And I said that actually um, I, I had this idea of making a... Uh, Moon rover, and uh, moon rover. Have you heard of these like rovers that NASA have in Mars and Moon? So Ma NASA has a rover, a Mars rover called Curiosity, and this is a rover that's sort of moving around on the surface of Mars, doing you know research, explorations, and this Curiosity is designed in an interesting way. So. Th the tire, the, the wheel of the Curiosity, as it walks around, as it moves around the surface, it leaves prints, leaves these prints on the surface of Mars, and it's, it says JPL, JPL on the surface of the Mars. So that's the name of the NASA Mars, uh, NASA Research Laboratory. So when I saw that, I thought, come on, like, if you really want women in space, instead of leaving these marks saying JPL, 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 why don't you design the wheels so that it leaves super strong female footprints on the Mars, <laughs> surface of the Mars, especially, like, superhero high heel footprints, like Sailor Moon. So <laughs> when I made that suggestion, you know, we had, like, oh, okay, maybe that's an interesting idea. And we started up talking about creating this sort of fictional prototype moon rover that moves on the surface of the moon, leaving these Sailor Moon superhero high heel footprints, and maybe possibly erase some of the Neil Armstrong footprints already on the moon, <laughs> possibly. So, you know, the best thing is actually get women on the surface of Mars or the moon, but as a gesture, maybe we could build this uh, moon rover. And uh, so I started making this prototype moon rover with uh, advice from engineers at uh, Johnson Space Center. I visited Houston, Texas. And uh, then I started working with like, engineers, product designers, and made this sort of prototype moon rover. And I also created a music video about this main character, Selena. So she really wants to go to the moon because she has a big crush on this superhero samurai woman who fights evil aliens on the surface of the moon, Lunar Girl. And because she really wants to be this Lunar Girl, she makes this moon rover. And if she can't go to the moon now, she's going to make this moon rover and launch it into the space and leave her mark on the moon. And she's actually inspired by a real uh, middle school girl for her Hallmark assignment, you could, if you Google search Hello Kitty in space, you're going to see this on YouTube. She launched her favorite Hello Kitty into space and filmed this using GoPro. And uh, this is all through like DIY uh, you know, science that she uh, found online. So I want to talk about how these DIY amateur scientists uh, making these sort of mini gigantic mini, well, her amateur leaps of humankind 
uh, in this uh, future of uh, science history. So instead of selective few, few people making this gigantic leap to humankind, maybe you know, not through you know, a political race or Cold War rivalry against uh, USSR, maybe we can make these leaps of, uh, leaps of humankind through uh, romantic wish. So I'm going to play you the video, and I think that fills up. <laughs> oh, that's also a video, another, uh, you should, uh, you know, you should see her video too. So could you turn the volume a little bit up?
Thank you. And, you know, um, thank you so much. And some people ask me, okay, so you made a film about female power, but why, why high heels? You know, they're, they're often, sometimes they're seen as something that's against, you know, against female power, but, but I'm a Sailor Moon generation. I, I grew up watching Sailor Moon kicking, <laughs> and for, for me, you know, it, it's, for me, I, okay, today I, I, today I had to take them off to, you know, for my mic, microphone, <laughs> but for me, I, I really felt uh, something that's uh, really close to me, and that's how I made this uh, Moon Rover and the video. So I have more um, videos, I have more projects online, so if you go to YouTube, Sputnik or you can see more. And I, this is you know, a great honor to be here with so many great people and lots of women as well. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much.